So you might remember that we've talked about complex numbers being some number z equal a plus bi, where a is the real part of z and b is the imaginary part of z, and a and b are both real. And we've talked about how we would then, of course, be able to add, subtract, multiply, divide complex numbers using the sort of algebraic definitions, which is basically like collect like terms, expand, use conjugates, which is all like your irrational things there. And, you know, that was really the focus there. And we also talked about how we might use that to sort of solve quadratic equations that had no root roots. That is all important. And that's sort of the algebraic approach. Today, though, we're going to now be thinking a little bit differently about a complex number. So not so much algebraically, but how it might be represented graphically. So a complex number can be represented in many different ways. And one way is, you know, algebraically, as z equals a plus bi, and that's what you'll be doing practice on. But one other way is to think about it sort of geographically. And let's consider it as a point. So we can think of it, so see, because a complex number has two parts, right? It's got a real part and an imaginary part, right? And, you know, and we said A plus B I, but often, you, another way often you see it is written as X plus I Y, and that might make it more, even more accessible if I do it this way. So can you see that kind of, if we just go, hey, the real part is X and the imaginary part is Y, then we kind of have a point, like an X, Y point on, on, on like a graph. So basically we can just, you know, we can just graph it as, you know, point, you know, X, Y or A, B to whatever letters you choose. So that is one other way we can represent a complex number. I mean, there are many ways. We're only going through the first two. There are, there are other ways, just to be clear. But first way is the algebraic way. And the second way is quite clear. We just take the real part and imaginary part separately, think of them as X and Y coordinates and graph it out, all right? So if we have, let's say Z equals three plus four I, let's take it one with numbers to start with, all right? Then basically we're just gonna graph out some, you know, coordinate axes. And we kind of just go three across. We go four up. So we say this is the point three, four. And this point three, four can be represented, like, let's call this point P. So point P, point P has coordinates three, four and represents the complex number z equals three plus four i. So yeah, we just think of it as a point now. So every single point on, on this sort of plane here obviously has a sort of x and y corner as we used to think about them. And that will therefore be, you know, representing some complex number, including real and imaginary. And if you think about this, where will the real numbers be on this diagram? Wait, like on the graph? Yeah, on the graph. So on this graph, if I take the real number, so like let's take one, where would one be? Just like um, one on the x-axis? Yeah, it's going to be here, right? Where's two? Like one over? Where's 10? Like there. <laughs> and pi is here, right? And negative one's here and so on, right? So negative one, negative two, and pi will be somewhere like here and so on, right? Yeah. So where will the real numbers be? Um, on the axis. Which axis, to be clear? Axis. Yeah, so basically in this diagram, the real numbers will therefore lie on the x-axis, so to speak. And so what sort of numbers would lie on the y-axis then? The imaginary ones? So purely imaginary, yeah. So imaginary numbers 
therefore lie on the y-axis. And so, you know, this, this is often represented by x and y. We do often represent them as x and y, but if we're being more specific, what does the x-axis represent? Real numbers. It, uh, 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 well, the x-axis is the real numbers, but I suppose, okay, what does the x-coordinate represent? Like so what, what, yeah? The horizontal position. Uh, yeah, but what would the horizontal represent as far as the complex number goes? The real part. Exactly. So what we're saying is that, you know, we're, we're just labeling the axes. We're saying that this is the real part of Z and this is the imaginary part of Z. And look, because Z is often written as X plus I, Y, that that is quite commonly done, then you do often see this, rep, you, know, you know, replaced by X and Y. You do see that as well. But to be clear, you know, you need to understand what X and Y represent. And to be clear, this is not your, you know, this is not your real number plane, although in many ways it's kind of like it. We call this the argon diagram. So the argon diagram is basically when the real axis, the, when, the, when the horizontal axis is, you know, the real part and the horizontal axis, uh, the vertical axis is the imaginary part. And if you've got the R diagram, you've got some point, you can just read off the real part, you know, the real part and the imaginary part, and that will be your complex number. Pretty simple, yes? Mm -hmm. And so if you think about how this sort of relates to real numbers, how do we relate to real numbers? How do we graph real numbers? Mm -hmm. Like the imaginary part of zero? Oh, well, sure. But let, let's go back to real numbers. Forget complex numbers for now. How do we graph real numbers? Take E rate. Like y equals mx with b? No, 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 no. That, that's, that's, that's with, like, that's not numbers. That's a, that's a line. How like do we represent... Points. How do we represent numbers? Like all the real numbers? On a number line? Exactly, right? Just like that, right? Yeah. So you just had like zero and you just had like one, two, negative one, negative two. So this is the number line, which is fine for real numbers. Now for complex numbers, this is basically the equivalent for complex numbers. We basically just said, well, real numbers aren't enough anymore. So now we're just gonna, you know, expand. This is the real numbers, right? Left, right, as before. But now we kind of expand up, down. So in one other way you can think about it is that the real numbers are one dimensional and the complex numbers are two dimensional. So you could have some sort of point here, right? Let's say that's, you know, x, y. So that means that's going to be x across and y up. And, you know, that would represent, you know, p, x, y would represent, you know, complex number x plus i, y. And, you know, I think a lot of students get kind of confused with the terminology. So let's sort of set the groundwork early. Capital P is a point. And x and y are real numbers, which are the coordinates of this point. But z is the complex number. So z is not a point. Z is a complex number. But it can be represented by a point, which I'm labeling capital P right now. But the real part of Z is equal to the, you know, uh, X coordinate of the point and the imaginary part of Z is equal to the Y coordinate of the point. Everything yeah. clear there? Good. All right. So let's kind of um, sort of expand on this concept here. So is there a concept in real numbers that tells us how far away I am from the origin, from zero? Like, you know, if I take a number, how do I work out how far it is from zero? Um, the distance formula. Well, for, for this, for, for the real numbers. Oh, I know. You just, just 
Isn't it just the number from zero? Well, it could be. Is that the only possibility? Um, well, like what, the... what if you're like negative? What if you're like negative 10? How far away are you from, your, are you from zero? 10 units. Yeah, you are 10 units away. So how do I go from the number to the distance? Absolute value. Right. So, you know, when you did absolute value, you may have learned that it represented the distance of the number from zero. So the concept of distance in real numbers was like, you know, the absolute value of your X, you know, represents graphically. If you think about it graphically, I mean, obviously there's the algebraic definition as always. There's the, you know, the algebraic definition, just a bit of revision is, you know, X if X is positive or equal to zero and negative X if X is negative. But the, you know, graphical sort of, interpretation is, you know, the distance from x to zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, you know, there's a, also another alternative algebraic definition, which is the square root of x squared. So that's just revision for your absolute value there. So you can see how things have both an algebraic definition or even more than one, as well as a graphical sort of interpretation, yes? Yes. Now, what did I say was equivalent to absolute value for complex numbers? Um, modulus? Exactly. So if the modulus is going to be the equivalent, then what should it represent? The distance. Um, and how would you find the distance? The modulus? <laughs> no, no, no. Think about it. P is here, right? Yeah. Where are we measuring from? From zero. The hypotenuse. Which is here, right? So how will we find that distance? Pi seven. Pretty much. Oh, a squared plus b squared. Where is it? Yeah. Uh, and wasn't that what we told you was the modulus? <laughs> yeah. So that's why, you know, similarly, the modulus of z, so the modulus of z, so firstly, it's written the same way, but obviously we read it as the modulus of z now. So the modulus of z is algebraically the square root of x squared plus y squared, since I've picked x, y here. So, no, so this is the algebraic definition. But as I'm saying, you know, you know, when we first did out the modulus, I said, yeah, just do the algebra for now. But there is a meaning behind it. And graphically, it represents the distance from zero or the origin. Right? Yeah. And we're now going to start being able to give you some meaning behind the things we're doing. So modulus of z, so, and, and you need to be good at both. You need to be good at both the algebra and the graphical, all right? So modulus of z algebraically is defined to be the square root of the real part of z all squared, you know, plus the imaginary part of z all squared. And if we, you know, just replace that with x squared plus y squared, if we let, you know, for, for you know, if z equals x plus i, y, do you have a preference between X and Y or A and B? Um, no. right. So I'll use X plus I, Y here. But importantly, graphically though, it represents the distance from origin to Z. That's very important to understand that. So it doesn't matter where Z is. I mean, I've been drawing them in the first quadrant for now, but let's start, change that up a bit. So if you've got, you know, X, Y here, where X is negative, that doesn't change the fact that the distance from the origin would be represented by, you know, this line here, or it's essentially the length of this line. So essentially the length of this line equals modulus of z. And you will notice that, you know, this is, you know, some negative number a, you know, and this is some positive number b, and, you know, you would still take 
that up, right? Yeah. Good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, now that we're comfortable with that, let's look at another concept that we have not talked about before. And let's go back to the first quadrant just to keep things simple. So we've got some point P, I'll use AB here, just, you know, because X and Y can be negative and I'll assume A and B are positive. So we've got this representing, so, so in other words, OP equals the modulus of Z and you should be happy with that by now. Um, P represents Z equals A plus BI and hopefully you're happy with that by now as well. Now, can you see that there is this angle here? Yeah. Right. Now, how would we find that angle? Um, um, inverse tan of the gradient. Yeah, or B over A. So what we have is this new concept. We have the concept of the argument of Z. All right. So the argument of Z is the angle between, so the horizontal to the right. So, you know, we're going to the right, we're not going to the left. So we're not working out this angle. We're not working out the angle on the left. It's always from the angle to the right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the line or more technically, later on we'll say ray. Ray is more correct. Do you understand what a ray is? Um, What's the difference between a ray and a line? Um, a ray starts from a point. Yeah, it doesn't go forever. So, so we're saying it goes from O and goes towards P. Yeah. So it doesn't continue. So yeah, if you understand the distinction, which, you know, would have been mentioned in earlier years, but I think most people forget because, you know, it's not, you know, used that much. Um, and, you know, you can, you can think of it as a line if you prefer, but technically it's a ray because, you know, it doesn't, you know, or you can think of a line interval, whatever, but basically, you know, it doesn't from O to P. So either we think of it as a line or a ray, it won't matter for now. It will matter later for low kind things, but it, the, it's, a, it's the angle between the horizontal and the line joining O to P, and importantly, in the anti-clockwise direction. So in other words, theta equals the argument of Z. So in other words, this angle theta here represents the argument of Z. I've got an argument. Um, I'm not sure, but that, that is just the term. So I guess it's a bit like y called the modulus. I'm not sure about that either, yeah. um, but that, that is just the term that's used. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, you would, um, simplify it to ARG. ARG represents argument. So just like logarithm represents lo log represents logarithm, ARG represents argument. Okay. Now, in my specific example here, if P is in the first quadrant, what would can you tell me about the argument of Z? If Z is in the first quadrant, what can you tell me about the argument of Z? It is less than 90. And? And? Greater than? Greater than zero. Yeah, it's acute, basically, is another way to put it. But yeah, it's greater than, so you know, quite clearly, if, if Z is in first quadrant, then that means the argument of Z must lie between pi over two and zero. Um, if Z is in quadrant two, what can you tell me about argument of Z? Um, it's between 90 and 180. Yep. And we'll start using, you know, gradient. So, oh. so another way to is describe it in words is it's, um, obtuse 
Now, if Z is in, let's do quadrant four. What would you tell me for quadrant four? Um, in between 270 and 360. Okay, so that's not wrong. We'll stick with that for the moment. So firstly, we'll use radian. Okay. Yeah. And then what would you say for more? Quadrant three. Um, between pi on two and three pi on two. Uh, between, try again. You're on the right track. Maybe you just said the wrong thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. From pi to three pi to two, yeah? All right, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, technically, you know, we don't necessarily know, like, you know, let's say this is 45, right? Let's say it's 45 degrees, yes? Yeah. Now, if it's 45 degrees, if we're using radians pi over 4. Yeah? yeah? Now, I don't necessarily know it's pi over 4. It could also be kind of like, you know, we can go around one and a bit times. So it could be 405 degrees. Or it could, we could go around twice and add 45. So it could be like, you know, 765 degrees and so on, right? Yeah. And obviously, you know, we're talking about the, we can use the radian versions for them. So the point is we don't actually know like a set angle necessarily, yes? Yeah. So we introduce the concept of what's called the principal argument of Z, which is usually what ARG represents. So we'll need to modify this a bit. You'll, you'll see that in a moment. So this needs modification a bit. So depending on a textbook in your school, but this is generally true, some places may use different um, definition. So some textbooks and so forth, but we've got what's called the principal argument of Z. But I'm pretty sure that this is still the, this is the majority and the vast majority of them. This basically restricts the argument to one revolution. So basically, we, we make it so that you can't give me answers like, you know, 4,000 degrees or, or the, you know, 8 pi or 9 pi over 2. Like, we, we want it within one revolution, yes? Yeah, where is argument like a trig thing? Like, is it like 10? Or... Um, so, no. It, it, so, to, so, to cap, so, it's not a trig thing because it is the angle. It is theta. Oh, okay. Like argument of Z is theta. Oh, okay. So yeah. no, so Z is not an angle. So no, it's not a trig thing like that. So, okay. so in a way you could say it's a function. So it, it's, it's like a trig function in the sense that you are applying an argument function on Z to get the angle. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, but it's, not, it's not like a trig function in that sense. Because, <laughs> you know, you're not putting an angle in, right? But, but if you're trying to say, like, is it a function, then yes, it is a function. Okay. But, so it's a function that you apply to, real no, uh, to, to complex numbers. Yeah? yeah? And the output is an angle. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And so the argument of a complex number represents the angle that the, you know, the complex number kind of the rate of the complex number makes with the horizontal in the anti-clockwise direction. Now, firstly, we will introduce this concept of the principal argument. So normally, arg z is the principal argument. So there is only one answer to that. So we're making it so there's only one answer. And normally, your score might be different, but usually this is the way that most people go with. Less than or equal to pi and greater than negative pi. So you'll notice that it's not zero to two pi, it's negative pi to positive pi. <clears throat> so it's restricted to <clears throat> one revolution only, but it's not from zero to two pi, but from pi to negative pi. So I'll give you some examples. 
So if we have, for example, one one. then you can see that this angle is going to be 45 degrees or pi over four. So in other words, arc of one plus i equals pi over four. On the other hand, I could have negative one uh, root three. So if I have the argument of negative one plus root three i, because that's what that point would represent, then you might recognize that this is going to be 60 degrees, but the argument using blue is going to be 120 degrees, or in other words, two pi over three. If I have something like this, so I might have something like, you know, negative root three minus one. So this will be represented by the argument of negative root three minus i, basically. And that would mean that this angle here is 30 degrees. But see, if we are restricted to negative pi to pi, I don't go around this way anymore because it's too far over. So mm -hmm. I go around this way. And since I've changed direction, I need to represent that with a negative. So this is, you know, this is in terms of angles, it is, you know, 150 degrees in this direction. And that's important to represent the direction, which means it will be represented as negative five pi over six. So this is negative five pi over six. And that's why I stressed earlier in the anti-clockwise direction for positive, right? So this is, you know, represents the fact you're going clockwise. And, you know, if you've got something like say here, So let's just pick, um, I'll deliberately not pick exact values this time, just to just you know, represent. So let's say it's like, like one negative two. All right. So this would be the argument of one minus two i. Now this will be, you know, that angle there. And that, you know, I'll have to work out the sort of, you know, you can either you work out the acute angle using positive numbers and so on, but for this question, you can see that basically, you know, maybe I'll draw it out at the top to make it a bit clearer, but you can see that this is one and this is two and I'm trying to find this angle. Yes. Yeah. So theta will therefore basically, if we're looking at the acute angle that's positive, it's tan inverse of two, yeah? So without looking at any sort of formulas, so not relying on any formulas, just focusing on the trig, which I think is more important than remembering formulas, an argument is most definitely something that you don't want to just remember formulas for, for reasons that we'll get into as we go on. I'm basically saying that it's going to be negative, because I'm going clockwise, of tan inverse of two. And you know, we can use radian, if we, you turn your calculator into radian mode, you know, you can work that out as a number if you like. Um, so it's going to be approximately negative 1.107 in radian. So this is what's called the principal argument of Z. The key thing is that to, rec to recognize that an argument of Z is actually always representing an angle. And it's always represented, you know, it's got to be an angle that's, you know, between negative pi and pi. So quadrant one and two will be positive. Quadrant three and four will be negative based on our sort of thing here. Yeah. So note that therefore the absolute value of the argument of Z therefore should always be less than or equal to pi. 
the argument of z must therefore be positive for quadrants one and two. The argument of z must therefore be negative for quadrant three or four. And let's also look at some sort of, you know, key ideas here. What does it mean if argument of z equals zero? Think about it. Um. Then the angle is zero. Correct. So what does that mean? What sort of thing do we have with z? Like a horizontal line. Well, that's the graph. But z can be anywhere on this line, yeah? Yeah. So what sort of numbers are we including here? Oh, only real numbers. All of them? Yeah. Okay, have a think about this. What does it mean if the arg of z is... Okay, okay, let me... let me. Because there's a few things we want to clear up as we go. What if I've got a number here, all right? What's the argument of z? Let's, let me do it that way. If I've got a number on the left, so let's, like, let's say minus 3, what's the argument of that? Zero. Uh, it's not zero. Um. It is not zero because it's going from the horizontal to the right. 180. So in other words, that would be 180 degrees or pi. So in other words, the argument for, for that one, now is it positive or negative 180, to be clear? Positive. Yeah, so by definition, and this is the one, so you know, the only time it overlaps is you know, at 180, and by definition, we've defined to take the positive in that, in, in that case. So negative is obviously not wrong, so to speak, but just because we've defined it this way, we would prefer the, you know, by our definition, in that case, the principal argument is pi. Yeah. So this is going to have an argument of pi, positive pi. Now, so if argument of z is zero, what type of number do we have? Positive real number? Yeah, so it's not any real number. So that means, you know, this is the case for positive real numbers. Now, what if it's like pi? Um, a negative real number. Yep, so strictly it's not negative pi, if we're using the principal definition here. So this is um, a negative real number. So that line kind of leaves us in an interesting situation here that I might want to um, talk about. See, we've talked about positive real numbers, right? Yeah. We've talked about negative real numbers, right? Yes. So what number have we not talked about that's real? Zero. Yeah. So let's think about that. What is the argument of zero? So think about it. What do you think? Undefined. Exactly. Because, you know, the question is basically in which direction do we go from zero to zero? And the answer is, well, you don't need to go anywhere. No direction. It's kind of like when we did our, you know, displacements and things, and I said, okay, you got back to where you are. What's your displacement? In that particular case, you don't give a direction because, well, your vector is just zero, right? Mm -hmm. So indeed, important to note that argument of zero is not defined. Now, it's also important to note that this is different to argument of z equals zero. So, I mean, as long as you're clear about what we're saying, it should be fine. But some people get these two things mixed up. We're not saying that the argument can't equal zero which it most certainly can, because, well, we've just shown you that it equals zero in this case. So the argument can equal zero, but you can't take the argument of zero. Yeah. Yeah. 
that, that's different, right? And because we can't take the argument of zero, therefore zero is excluded. So whenever you're doing arguments, you know, you need to exclude this zero. There's an open circle. And so for that reason, always be very careful with arguments. Arguments are sort of quite, I suppose people might say tricky. Um, there's sort of, you know, there's domain restrictions you need to think about. So for that reason, you know, always have an open circle. Mm -hmm. So like if you draw a graph, regarding argument, then you just have to put a circle at the argument always? Well, you have to put a circle when the thing inside the argument is zero, but that's not necessarily zero. So, so what, what do I mean by that? So, so, okay. So, all right. I'm basically saying, you know, what about argument of Z minus one? See, if Z equals zero, then I'm just talking the argument of negative one, which is fine. You see? So it's, 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 you know, it's kind of like when the inside can't equal zero. Do you see what I mean? So there will be an open circle somewhere. I just can't guarantee that it's going to be at the origin, depending on the exact question, right? Because obviously, you know, I'm starting with the very basic things, but obviously things will change. So I don't want to give you that rule set in stone and then it, you, perhaps you might get confused later. Yeah. Um, so there will be an open circle somewhere. And that somewhere is when the thing inside the bracket is zero, but that's not necessarily the origin itself. Does yeah. that make sense? So while we're on this topic, before we do any more, do you see any sort of, what, what sounds like this? You know, what sort of thing can't you take a zero of in real numbers? So you can't take a zero of? So, so you, said a log, you, said, you said argument is a function, right? Yeah. So what function can't you evaluate zero? Log. Yeah. So one thing that might help you, I mean, it's not strictly 100% true, but you can think of it as a shortcut. Think of argument as the complex version of log. I mean, not, not exactly true, but if there is some sort of rationale to this, but not, not you know, I'm not actually saying it is log. I'm just saying that, um, so you know, logarithm, gets abbreviated to LOG, argument gets abbreviated to ARG. They both can't be evaluated at zero, so that may help you sort of remember things like that, right? But the other reason why I suggested you think of it as log, and you probably don't need to, you know, focus on this now, focus on the sort of, you know, you can actually have to argument algebra. So I'm, I'm gonna do just very, very, very briefly run through it with you. I don't want you to focus on this yet, and we will, you know, because this is going to, uh, I want you to focus on the graphical, but I just want you to see why I say that. Because, you know, tell me, log of zero is? Undefined. Log of, you know, x times y is? Log x plus log y. Log of x over y is? Log x minus log y. Log of x to the power of m is? m log x. All right. Take a guess. Or, you know, argon zero is? Undefined. You can probably guess the others. Argument of z1 times z2 is? Argument of z1 plus argument of z2. Argument of z1 over z2 is? Argument of Z1 minus argument of Z2. Argument of Z1 to the power of N is? N argument N1. Yeah. So there are so-called argument rules that, you know, we will focus on a bit later. I don't really want to focus on them right now, but the, the, I'm just kind of briefly running them here right now, just to kind of let you know the, the reason why I'm saying it might be helpful I'm not saying they are exactly the same thing. I'm not saying it actually is, but I'm just saying that it might help you to think of argument as a log in, in the sense that it, there are, you know, the rules helps you remember the rules because they're analogous. And the fact is you can't evaluate at zero is analogous as well. Yeah. But what you want to focus on certainly for now 
is the graphical interpretations. And so the argument simply represents an angle. You can't evaluate an angle, you know, from yourself to yourself, like you're just not going anywhere. It's like, which direction do I go from the North Pole to the North Pole? Like, you don't go anywhere, right? The principle, the angle, obviously, because it's a revolution, you can spin as many times as you like. But if we talk about the principle argument, then there's a particular angle we're after. So we restrict it to minus pi to pi. Things to note, of course, are it's positive for quadrant one and two, negative for three and four. Obviously acute for quadrant one, obtuse for quadrant two, negative acute for quadrant four, and negative obtuse for quadrant three. Um, just interpreting it this way, we can then say that if its argument of z is zero, then it's a positive real number, not including zero, right? Just to be perfectly clear on that point. And if argument of z is pi, strictly not negative pi, if, you know, same thing, but that's the strictly the correct answer, then it will be a negative real number, not including zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do you think would be the argument? Of, what, if, what if the argument is, you know, pi over two? Um, then it is... Oh, it's a positive imaginary number. Yeah. Um, two, and then a negative imaginary for minus pi. So basically, yeah, you got the idea. So it kind of just goes that way because, you know, you want that to be sort of 90 degrees and excluding that. So it's basically going to be an imaginary. So it's going to be a, you know, imaginary number whose, you know, imaginary part is positive. And, you know, the, this one, it will kind of be going that way. So this will be, you know, an imaginary number where the imaginary part will be negative. So another way you can, you know, talk about it is, you know, in this case, the real part of Z will be equal zero in both cases, right? So let's put these together then. So, I mean, we, we've said this and this is correct. So if we think about it, you know, in terms of arguments, right? What is the condition for a purely imaginary number? What do I need? The part equals zero. Well, that's one option. So that's the sort of, algebraic definition, right? So either one, real part equals zero, correct? But can you now think about it graphically? What other restriction could we essentially put on it to essentially say the same thing? Um, the argument of Z can't be zero or positive pi. But I mean, what if it's like, you know, pi over four, that's still not purely imaginary, right? Um, it has to be pi on two. Or? Negative pi on two. Yeah. So that's the, like, so, so there's the sort of algebraic way to define it. And there's kind of the, well, argument, but in a way, geographical sort of interpretation way to define it. Yes. So some of the questions that you were doing before, you know, I was thinking about it this way to, and, and, you know, how I was trying to tell you sort of domain restrictions. Well, we haven't done enough yet, but I'm just telling you that, yeah, I was telling you how doing it, looking at it algebraically, it's very hard to see what the restrictions were. But if you were thinking about it geographically or geometrically, it's actually very easy to see what the restrictions would have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of building up the building up blocks here, but a stress is not one replaces the other. You, they, you know, some things, you know, algebraic ways are better. Some things, geometric ways or graphical ways are better. And you really need to be really good at both of them. So summing up just as well, um, just, just also, so we've now introduced the concept of modulus of Z, which is the distance 
of z from the origin. And just, you know, just remember that's of course, you know, square root of a squared plus b squared, where z equals x plus iy. The argument of z represents an angle, you know, from the, you know, measured from the horizontal to the right. And, you know, the line joining origin to z in anti-clockwise direction. And that will be, um, you know, by definition, the principal argument is between pi or equal to, but strictly greater than negative pi. I have not given you a formula for argument of z. And your, while your books may or may not, um, some of them are correct, some of them are wrong, depending on how they present it. Um, there, are, there are things you need to watch out for. Uh, arguments quite tricky, you know, with, with the open circles and certain things that I have not yet really talked about. So I don't want you to, I definitely don't want you to memorize a formula for argument. I, I think it's much better, even when you do know the formulas, that you understand what it represents, that's much more important, and then, you know, work backwards logically from there, right? Um, there, there are exceptions and so forth and, and things like that. I mean, we can give you a formula for every situation, but then we're giving you like multiple formulas. So it's much better that you understand what it is rather than just go, well, my formula told me that, all right? Yeah. And if Z is purely real, then that means it lies on the sort of X axis or real axis is probably the real name. Mm -hmm. Algebraically, that means the imaginary part equals zero. Now, what does that mean about the argument? The argument Think about it. Equals zero pi. Yeah. And if Z is purely imaginary, then it would lie on the imaginary axis. So we don't really call them X and Y axes when we talk about the argon diagram. The more formal name is real and imaginary axis. Although if you said X and Y axis, you probably would get away with it. They're usually not that picky, but you know, real part of course is then zero. And the argument of Z could either be positive or negative pi over two, depending on if it's you know positive or negative. Yeah. Great. Do you have any questions about what we have covered? Um, no. Good.